Hello, hello. Um, welcome to Writers and Books Meet the BOA Author Series. I'm Sakshi Kumar, the Adult Programs Coordinator at Writers and Books. For those of you who are new to us, Writers and Books is a nonprofit literary arts center in Rochester, New York. We offer readings, workshops, a bookstore, and literary programming for people of all ages and backgrounds. You can find more information at our website, wab.org. Writers and Books would like to call attention to the complex and troubled history of the lands on which we live and work. We're hosting this event from the unceded ancestral homelands of the Onondaga, or the people of the Great Hill. In English, they are known as the Seneca people, or the keeper of the Western door. We're so happy to have three authors with us tonight. First, we'll hear Lindsay Burnell read. Then, we'll welcome Matt Donovan to the podium. And then we'll close with the reading from Daniela Cadena Doolin. As a reminder, we'll wrap up the reading here and then invite everyone to join us downstairs for refreshments in our first floor classroom, where our authors will also be signing books, which are for sale in our bookstore. Welcome, Lindsay. So does this pick up my voice? I yeah. just asked in the chat, it should be broadcast to the judge line. Okay, thank you. Thanks so much. Um, thank you to Catherine for organizing this and everyone at BOA. And thank you so much to everyone at Writers and Books. Thanks so much to Allison for everything you do here. Writers and Books has become a kind of home away from home at this point. It's, this is my third Writers and Books reading. Um, I also want to say how honored I am to read with Matt and Danielle. Um, Danielle's the reason we're all here. I'm so, so happy to share Rochester with her and to celebrate Desire Museum. Her beautiful newborn book. Um, okay. My first book, what it doesn't have to do with, opens with a poem for Danielle, um, who, you know, has been my dear friend in this world and in this thing called poetry for, I don't know, like two decades. <laughs> and I don't know, I don't know what I would do without her and her poems. Heartbroken in your memoir. Thank you for immortalizing me in half a sentence while you, the protein go-getter, feed me soup, jasmine tip tea. If I were to meet my 21-year-old self now, I'd never befriend her. But you fell into my lap, literally. The night Ryan drugged us and I begged you to get me the hell out of Lowell. Thank you for that and for your Lady of Shalott look. For being the only girl I kissed at the lesbian party we waited all fall for, somewhere on the Lower East Side, almost too East to count back then, when Queens was still cheap, my life a milky white, opaque and vague. Who among us hadn't been compromised? One morning waking up saying to nobody, how did that happen? Then walking home in the same clothes we laid out the day before, in shoes not meant for distances or daylight, past everyone with headsets commuting to wall. After six months, you left, and I moved to the R's last stop, my apartment so close to the tracks it shook. If you haven't read Danielle's memoir, The Riots, you should. It's amazing. Um, if you don't know me, then you probably don't know that I'm from Rochester. And so I had to I had to read a Rochester poem. The rest of what I've been reading is from my second in progress manuscript. And um, there's so much more of Rochester in that book. And I, it's weird to me <laughs> because I, I, I thought I was telling Danielle, I thought I got rid of all the embarrassing stuff with this book. And then it's just like worse. <laughs> So here we go. Rochester will recognize some of these places and, and maybe even 
um, maybe even uh, the news the news story that was circulating in in the late nineties, um, you know, real story of of teenagers. Um, tragic story. Okay. Um, so also my poems have, you know, they're they're true-ish. Um, <laughs> Okay, I have hot boxed and I have I have done drugs with Abby Wambach, but the, but but I did those things were not happening simultaneously, okay. like they are in the poem. Okay, um, brief history of my Catholicism. Hot boxing in my K car with Abby, the star of my school, the whole state. The can of worms interchange, a buzz above us. I was waiting for the bridge and someone saved my life tonight. In my own slump, not head in the oven, head on into the deep end of the river, serious, but an obstacle nonetheless. In the Wendy's parking lot, all air piano and virginal, my breasts barely breasts, miles from what was happening closer to home on the trestle over the canal. There are Olin Mills portraits on a loop on the local news. In confession, I said I was jealous. They died in each other's arms, in love, and Father O'Connor behind the curtain demanded I take it back. When I told him an old man had exposed himself to me on the towpath, the priest asked why I was walking alone without one of my brothers. I remember feeding the ducks as the stranger's pants came down, waving to the packet boat named for another Rochester hero who disappeared into the Genesee after a failed dare. Sam Patch hadn't meant to die. He'd planned other jumps from bridges higher than high falls. This isn't a very good story. Sir Elton sings his better, rewritten by Topin, with the ridiculous sugar bear, the assonantal eye flooding the chorus. Deaths, of course, cliched, winged, a whispering butterfly, and maybe J plus M are angels, free to fly, fly away, high away, bye bye. I, I like can't sing Elton John. <laughs> Some people can get up there and, and sing those moments where they recite from songs, not me. Um, okay, so this. This one is is for my grandmother who recently passed away. She lived to be 101 and she lived in Rochester for um, a while at the Highlands. <clears throat> one June, she can't quiet her mind's wandering, searching the airport crowd for her beloved two decades dead who never recognizes her when she does find him at baggage claim. In her hospice bed, she's blind, just bones, derailed by these visions during the longest hour of night when the force of memory, even as it fades, is the most unforgiving. What did she give back? Over and over, only that sentence, anaphora. I wanna turn it all off. The breathing machine, her heaven-obsessed nurse who won't call death, death, but rather some ecstatic transition. Dying's not for sissies, a distant relative tells me, to which I say nothing, not even with a look. In my journal this month, I don't cross anything out. The finches in the golden rod at the edge of the yard stay, and the insane bells from the church next door, imagining someplace good. Um, okay, <laughs> this... um. I'm, I'm not gonna read that one. Okay. Um, this is the newest poem. I literally just finished it. So it's not in any journal yet. And um, here goes. The, the, the rest of my reading is elegiac and this is an elegy for the earth. Camden Pastoral. They're siblings licking each other clean in a gutted car that was once worth something. A carapace perfect for multiplying. Another just surfaced from under the steering wheel, brazen, no more birds to kill. But someone's feeding them. 
Someone stole their brother and domesticated him in, a, in an efficiency on the Delaware. The narrative that haunts us all, a whole meal in a slow cooker, unremarkable wine, diatribes against breeding. What kind of world would our progeny exist in? What has become of the ozone layer? We have the right to ruin everything and will. A boil water advisory again, this time crypto, not that crypto. The kittens don't mind a contamination, content in their infested, irreparable Mercedes impounded in the 90s. When it seemed possible to fix the earth or possible to ignore our neglect of it. In Camden, New Jersey, there's nowhere to bike. The fungi lifting their bright orange heads from the rot astonish me. I'm betting on the kittens who seem to tolerate, even enjoy the most dystopian conditions. They're too inscrutable to disregard. And now everyone's a cat person and a birder downloading an app to identify birdsong following the birches painted with blue blazes never far enough away in this park turned traffic corridor at rush hour where we're listening like the hungry kittens for the rarest birds. My last poem um, is an elegy for, for my teacher. Um, and that's all I need to know. There's a lot of references, but it's okay. <laughs> Ars Poetica. For Stanley Plumley. No matter where I am, everywhere these days resisting solitude, the clouds are constables. I'm irritable waiting for what's next. Sex, a drink I shouldn't have, a jog around the crowded park. You are calmest at your desk, content in silence inside your mind, through by afternoon, back to brutal external life, teaching, meeting, emailing Jill, a revision that seems small but wasn't. I keep writing about whales and failing. In this painting by Celia Paul, who loves the Brontes, Constable too, live near Devon, which is why the ocean, if it's ocean, means something. Why I record water on my phone obsessively to listen to later. Does it make me more patient? Does it even make me see the sea swallowing the river at high tide? the thawing falls, or the best swimming hole I dove into from a cliff after terrifying weather. The sky at last relaxing looked just like cloud study, stormy sunset, no longer on view at the National Gallery. I don't want to forget the sound of the waves. Sorry. I don't want to forget the sound of the water, the sound of your voice, the ephemeral, more ephemeral, brightest before it's lost. Thanks so much. Hi, everyone. Hi. Um, thank you so much for coming. I am. I'm so thrilled to be here. Um, I I've had um, just a blissful couple of days in Rochester. I haven't been here in about. Um, 30 years, and um, I've just really enjoyed being in the town. It's been such a thrill to be at BOA headquarters, um, a place that has, I don't know, loomed large in my mind ever since I started writing poems. So um, to meet Peter and um, Catherine and Justine. So thank you so much um, for putting the event um, together. Um, and thanks to everyone at um, Writers and Books um, for doing this. And I'm, I'm also just thrilled to be a part of the celebration of Desire Mu Museum um, being out in the world. Um, and uh, Danielle and I have a New Mexico connection, but we've never actually met before. So yeah, it's just so wonderful um, to be here. And thank you all for coming. Um, I I also can't sing Elton John. I should say that from the outset. Um, I hope Danielle will rectify that when she comes up. Um, so I'll, I'm going to read, um, I think, just three pieces um, from the Dug Up Gun Museum, uh, my book with BOA. Um, so this is a book that um, focuses on guns and gun violence. Um, and um, I really, when I was writing it, I was talking to Peter about this earlier. I mean, I, I really wanted to go out and talk to people. I wanted to talk to gun owners. I wanted to talk to people um, who had been affected by gun violence. So I was traveling the country for a number of years, um, interviewing people and visiting communities 
I mean, wide ranging. Um, so, you know, uh, cities like Cleveland and Chicago, but um, also um, Cody Wyoming and Sandy Hook, um, and just really wanting to have a lot of conversation. So a lot of that, um, and also ended up in strange situations like um, a paintball reenactment of D-Day in Pennsylvania. Um, but so a lot of that is in this book. Um, and one of the places I, it just seemed important to set eyes on was NRA headquarters. Um, I just wanted to find a way to contend with that place, uh, that organization. And so um, so this poem is about uh, features a drive out there. Um, and um, but ends up focusing on what I learned what is attached to it, um, the National Firearms Museum. Um, and so I think everything else is pretty clear, except for just um, one quick detail, which is um, a lot of the, the guns that you see on display there, they're presented as art objects. Um, and a lot of them are decorated almost like a pointillism like style with these intricate drawings. Um, and so uh, the title refers to that. That comes back later in the poem. This is called Thousands or Millions of Tiny Dots of Varying Size. Once I drove through Virginia slush to NRA headquarters, the winter air humming with the emptiness of my plan, which was not much more than the hope of doing something beyond thoughts and prayers or any one word I might try to use after seeing a self-defense catalog with its photo of a young girl sitting cross-legged against the cinder block grid of a school wall as she grips a bulletproof backpack, raising it up so that it conceals her body more or less behind a kid-friendly style, which means blue with a cascade of emojis. For the last mile, I stared at strip mall signs, Jenny Craig, elegant dancing, lead by example, Taekwondo, that made me feel as if I was lost in someone's idea of what America should be, eye catching with plenty of parking and a flailing inflatable tube man who rises and falls, arms raised, frantic to explain that a memory foam mattress sells for less, guaranteed. Without an appointment or idea of what to do next, I sidestepped the lobby's Tom Selleck cutout, telling me something about freedom I forgot to write down, and strolled into the first room of the National Firearms Museum, carrying some vague hope of what? Whatever I'd come here to find, it wasn't Annie Oakley's pistol or a custom 12 gauge commemorating Princess Di's wedding or the gold inlaid half dozen geese soaring between trigger and bolt of a shotgun belonging to Herman Goring. A few lines of wall text described Bolino style, which meant I learned the process of utilizing thousands or millions of tiny dots of varying size to create subtly shaded scenes, which ranged from two coon hounds charging quail sheltered in long tangles of grass to a rifle's photorealistic Rolls Royce careening toward a woman, topless, lips parted, nestled against a tiger and peering into one mounted magnifying glass, I saw a gun engraved with a tribute to Picasso, featuring, I swear, a miniature Guernica that mimicked each detail of his horse and bull, the one jagged light in those bodies we've seen so many times, necks craned back, each mouth in a wail, rendered in a way that reduced any trace of sorrow to mere line and shape. America, I'm done with prayers and mirrored vitrines, the yellow dots of emojis wide-eyed on a kid's armored backpack in black dots too numerous to count, spread across those maps that track gun violence, 
and for what? Then again, here I am speaking to you within the silence of a poem, which is not much more than a form of prayer we've heard too many times that makes nothing change. By the time I'd finished wandering through the other rooms, it was too late to do anything but drive the same roads back to the hotel while half listening to classic rock and chasing after an idea about how we should step back and see the shape made by those black dots scattered across the US map. Although haven't we done that already? Stepped back and looked and long known what we've made? And I neglected to say how beautiful your reading was. I'm really sorry about that. Yeah, I wanted I wanted to gush about Rochester. Also, I realized, yeah, it was really really lovely. Well, thank you for that. Um, I'll tell a quick story too. I had I had the honor of meeting Gabby Giffords um, last spring, and um, um, give her a copy of my book, which was a thrill. And then we were talking about a number of things, um, and um, I was talking about this trip to NRA headquarters, and she. Um, got this kind of impish look on her face and she ended up telling the story about how, um, cause it is, it's so normalized, which was kind of jarring that you just drive off and like you're there in the strip malls and suddenly you're there at the um, NRA headquarters. Um, but uh, her organization realized that you could do one of the adopt a highway programs um, as you know, right near the exit where the NRA headquarters were. So they cleaned up trash for like six months outside that highway just so they could erect a sign that said cleaning up after the NRA since blah, 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 uh, the Gabby Giffords headquarters. And she just looked like she had pulled off the biggest prank of all time. She's super happy with herself. Um, I'm going to read a shorter piece. Um, this is a poem that um, uh, there's a poem by um, Wesala Simborska, the Polish poet, um, that has always haunted me. Um, Every case is the translation I read it as. And um, it's a survival poem, but it's um, in this fragmented syntax. Um, and it seems to speak towards like the arbitrary nature of survival. So I, I appropriated the form of that poem um, for this piece. And then um, the other, the, the title of this piece comes from an article that I happened to see in Self Magazine when I was doing some research um, for the pieces in this book. Um, and the title of that article, in terms of it's the normalization of violence that it implies, also just in, really haunted me. Mass shootings are actually pretty rare, but here's what to do if you're ever in one. It could happen once it happens, earlier, later, closer today, but not to you. You'll survive because you ran, because you hid, because you were first, because last, because alone, because the others. Of course, highly unlikely. Of course, situationally aware. Be sure the door won't open. Be sure the door won't close. Conceal, barricade. To the left, the right, accept the sound for what it is. If you're lucky, there will be a fence. If you're lucky, the fence has been removed. Perhaps a mug of coffee door wedge, scissors, the broken leg of a chair, a turn, a shirt, a second, perhaps a ballpoint pen. Thanks to calm, an element of surprise, in spite of and yet. What would happen if the eyes, the throat, the knees, a step away? So he is here, straight, from the moment without end. The nut, the gun, but you, the mesh? I can't be silent enough. Listen how quickly your heart is beating and mine. I'll just read one um, more piece because I'm excited to get to Danielle's reading. Um, 
So um, let's see, this is, um, this is a piece also that um, wasn't connected to the travels, um, but just um, ended up being a meditation, I hope, I think around just how normalized our shootings can be um, there. I think all you need to know is um, there's some references to um, Dylan Thomas's great poem, um, Fern Hill, his poem of uh, nostalgia and the fall from innocence. Um, and so there's uh, images uh, that are appropriated from that here. Um, you also, um, we were talking about, uh, I grew up in the Cleveland area. Um, you need to know that all of our sports teams lose all the time. Um, we probably already knew that, but uh, it's worth mentioning that's, that is referenced here. Um, thank you again so much for coming. Green means literally a thousand things or more. So concludes an essay on Fern Hill in which the student seems somewhere between jazzed up and pissed off that green might mean so many things from one stanza to the next. Here, a blooming Eden proxy. Here, rot made by the grip of time. For starters, or that sun-slaked field not far from our classroom, as lush green as any Welsh farmyard, grayed overnight with frost. Emerald beer bottle hurled from a car, the slack-jawed lime green goblin face spanning a front porch post-Halloween for so many weeks, it looks like it's here to stay. The long ago brown green of Cleveland, where it rained always and without pity upon a past I craved despite myself and our team lost always 14 to two. Every time we waited in the bleachers for the game to resume, my father would look down upon the outfield's mowed lines and proclaim, still a lot of green out there, meaning anything can happen and will. Have you ever heard in a crowd the saddest part of take me out to the ball game where everyone lies and pretends we don't care if we ever get back and makes the last word echo twice more. We always want to get back, whether or not we're hailing childhood green. Like the student in her essay, I too could keep rattling off images of spring and decay, June sunset horizon flash, summer hair stained olive from churning over chlorinated pools, green shadow of a hand that makes it feel as it says in the poem, as if owls were bearing everything away, instead of looking again at the image online I glimpsed before returning to my still ungraded hay high stack of student work. Maybe you saw it too. Maybe you also had the spellbound luck of wandering to other tasks instead of asking what it means to know anything can happen in a wholly different way. Instead of looking once more at the slash of police tape that is the only horizon that matters just now for the two men in the photograph who sit together on the curb, faces glowing blue, red and the lights, both of them bleary eyed, but alive, swaddled in aftermath and a blanket that is green, a detail that couldn't matter less, given how the numbers of the dead still rise. Here we are again, as inevitable as the clocks tick, looking in at a place that now will never be young again. Is there a way to say it? There's been a shooting that will allow it to be heard remembered and heard without the easy glide of our past tense that will stop us from wanting to turn to anything under the wide starry sky that is not the green fire burning in the minds of those men or the green of a blanket America provides and provides 
without change. Thank you very much. Hi, thank you so much for being here. I am so thrilled. I'm thrilled to be here in the first place. Um, I'm thrilled to be reading with Lindsay and Matt. Um, Lindsay, as you now know, I've known for you know several decades. And uh, Matt, I've known of, we kept sort of missing each other in Santa Fe. Um, and I, I also wanted to thank uh, Catherine for helping to organize and uh, Chris here at um, Writers and Books and everybody who's, who's, who's organized this. And I wanted to thank Peter so much for accepting the book and having me publish at BOA, which has been, which was a dream press for me. I've admired BOA so long um, that uh, this is just really a thrill for me. So thank you to everybody there. Um, I wanted to give you a little bit of uh, since <laughs> hello uh, do 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 some 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 sales work here. Uh, so the the book is organized into uh, four different sections. Um, Desire Museum um, because I think you know I I I've been picking at it for a long time, but a lot of different personal reasons sort of kept me from finishing it. I had two children sort of late in life, back to back. I started a tenure track job and then moved across the country to another one and then left that for a, a different one. Um, and I was sort of picking at it. And then after I turned 40 and uh, I started, I don't know, I was doing a lot of thinking about my past life and decisions and what I'd done and what I regretted and what I wish I'd done better. And so in some ways this book is, is sort of thinking back through, through that. Um, but the first section is, is to a certain extent organized thematically around the idea of um, communication um, and um, miscommunication, either through omission or through purposeful uh, miscommunication uh, and its personal and political ram ramifications. The second um, is more pointedly about desire, um, about uh, there's a lot of sapphic love poems in that particular section. The third one um, is uh, looking more toward um, environmental degradation and the various kinds of regret one feels thinking of that. that. And the fourth is um, largely elegiac um, around various friends that have passed um, and, and one in particular um, who committed suicide um, a few years ago. So um, that gives you some ideas. So this is gonna be a really light reading, lots of... <laughs> Lots of lots of jokes, lots of laughs, um, and you can tell that by the title of the first poem, um, which is "Self Doubt with Dead Lupine." <laughs> After summer, I clear away the vulgar corpses from my flower beds, coarse vinca, shriveled marigold, and molding lupine drained of color by an infestation of aphids that sucked its sweet sap dry. I learned too late. My son, who spurned my breast as an infant, still refuses most food. He's skinny, nothing like these soft-bellied bugs, almost mewling at the, custer at the clusters of candy-colored blooms. I knew the first time I drove away from him that our bond would fail, my ducts dry up. Though certainty didn't assuage me, my weaned breasts weeping all week. There's not much there. I used to say to boys who fumbled in my shirt, believing we should share in disappointment. I throttled the lupine, ripping it from the roots, remembering the June, it astonished me with its rising, growing wild along highways amid evergreens and ferns, where I witnessed its violet zeal, its art to thrive, it should be alive. This next piece is a little bit long. Um, so um, my, my mother's side of the family is uh, Mexican-American. And so I think a lot about the border situation and how my family arrived here. Um, and uh, so this poem is, is thinking, about, thinking about that, thinking about the children being separated from their families and how at some point in time that could have easily happened 
uh, to mind, though it didn't. The uncertainty principle. There's an epigraph here from the New York Times. It says, it may take federal officials two years to identify what could be thousands of immigrant children who were separated from their families at the southern United States border, the government said in court documents filed on Friday. That was in 2019. Oh, and also the other day, I've taken a, a, a lot of this text from, um, um, from a very small encyclopedic entry um, on... Um, the uncertainty principle in, in terms of physics. So only, so only so much can be known about a particle at a given moment. There is a limit, Heisenberg stated, to the precision with which one can measure the exact position and momentum of a particle. That is not a statement about a technological dearth. Rather, the uncertainty arises because the act of measuring affects the object being measured. The only way to measure the position of something is by using light, but on a subatomic scale, the interaction of light with the object inevitably changes the object's position and direction of travel. Two, only so much can be known about a part person at any given moment, a refugee child led into a dim tunnel. There is a limit, an official stated, to the precision with which one can measure the exact position of a child in sleep, how he can turn beneath his metallic blanket, the watchful focus of cameras and police dogs sniffing the rank neglect of his body. This is not a statement about a technological dearth. Rather, the uncertainty arises because the act of measuring affects the perspective of lawmakers. The only way to measure the position of lawmakers is by using light, but on a subatomic scale, the lawmakers' interaction with light inevitably changes their position and direction of blame. Three, only so much can be given to a child whose parents have tried to save them from a fragmented life, one of violence and thirst, and men whose howling greed for power and blood surpass all belief in light. There is a machete swinging wildly through what is left of a burning forest, but there is a limit to who we can let in given our scarcity of clean water and cash. This is not a statement about a financial dearth, only a way to slide the frame away from the child in the corner, arms crossed across her chest because she has forgotten her mother's face and the face of the armed guards offer her only revulsion. She is three. Four. I know, I know where the lost children go. Lo sé, sé a donde ven los niños desparecidos. I know, I know where the lost children go. Lo sé, sé a donde ven los niños desparecidos. La tierra está vacía como el cielo. Only so much can be known about knowing. Nuestros niños son tragados por oscuridad. They go into the mouths of wolves. Five. Some say the lost children are the lucky ones. Their inability to be reached, no cause for alarm. And the focus on these children who are likely with family displaces our focus on the children detained. On a mundane level, the lulling effect of safety contaminates our ability to see. See? No. Look here where the halfway people are pressed together so close against the chain link, they can't lie down beneath the Paseo del Norte bridge where citizens drive, their eyes narrowed by an influx of light, the unrelenting sun blurring their vision. As they pass over, they can almost hear the unsettled breathing, the indeterminate notes of a dying song, but lose the frequency when they reach the other side. They shrug. They can't be certain of what they've heard, though it haunts them as they lift cups of coffee to their tender tongues, which they burn, sipping then spilling the dark drink on their clean clothes, marking themselves with awkward inattention, which makes them so resigned they yawn long toward the empty skied windshield, their exposed throats revealing a silent dangle of flesh, the uvula which grows between what is uncertain 
and what has been left unsaid. So let's turn to the second section, <laughs> um, the sapphic love poems. And um, I have a series called The Lost Sapphics, and they're all two um, former ex-girlfriends of mine. I guess former and ex is redundant, but. Um, so um, to, just to let you know, I don't I don't write in proper sapphics. Proper sapphics has dactylic hexameter, which I cannot write in or haven't haven't tried to. These are these are what, what I call um, um, syllabic sapphics. It, it goes, it's a quatrain and it goes 11, 11, 11, and five. Um, and so this is, this is, this is a, this is a sad one after a breakup. Lost self in sapphics. Summer, then fall, winter, then spring, starlings arc like Spanish doorways or your pale back against my hands. For all I know, you've become a shark. I am dismantled by the throb of your mouth. I go to work. I go back home. I go to soirees where I stand numbly in the umbra of my own silence. Once, I think I see you across the room, but it's a mirror. You look so sad, so thin. I almost want to reach out to get you a whiskey to forgive you, though I've forgotten how. Do you remember me before you? It's not my party, so I can't cry if I want to. A femme crosses the room to chat me up. I don't really feel like being alone. She takes me home. She takes my hand and presses it to her chest. I don't remember how to do this, I say faintly. Your name fumbles out of my mouth like blasphemy. She forgives like a saint. Listen, I won't tell you the details, just that she was merciful. And when my eyes closed, we became dusk. Um, I'm gonna read this poem that ended up being inspired by one of my sons. Um, who, he, he, you know, all, all the drawings that you get when you're a kid, you're, you have children, right? It's just like drawing after drawing after drawing. And this one was particularly strange because it was just these box letters and it said lake box on it. And it had been like sort of smeared. I was like, what's a lake box? <laughs> and uh, he told me late, later, it's like, no, that was lakey box. It was like some YouTube channel that I, that, I, that I didn't even know that he'd been watching. So I'm a terrible parent. That's, that's the story that I'm telling you about this. Um, but um, I sat there thinking and I was sort of obsessed with this idea of a lake box and like, what would that be? And it's had so much, had so much um, interest for me in terms of thinking about the way in which like all of our kind of consumerist culture creates so much uh, like sort of toxicity in our planet. And, um, and then the idea of, of it being of like say even lakes being resold to us somehow in like a subscription um, because they're gone, but they're like, get a lake box, you know, that sort of thing. So that's what's going on in this, this poem. Lake box. How these days will arrive to us later, later. In a subscription box full of grit and loamy water, tadpole eggs and a thin skin of algae after all the real lakes have dried up. So we might consider how rare they are, how fine. The eyes of the world forever closed, we'll say, paying to walk circles around the puddle we poured at the center of our rooms, where we walk with linked arms, the call of night birds and insects and wind through the reeds singing from our speakers where we will undress and lay in the shallows, the moonlight barely reaching through the windows to the circles widening in the water from the dropped stone at the center of our minds. So there are a series of poems in here that I call remixes where I take um, an old uh, favorite poem from a favorite poet 
um, and I take um, sections or little pieces of phrases from their poem and I, and I mix them in with mine. They're a really strange form. Um, it's, it's a series of fragments. So you're gonna hear me sort of jump around, but the, the text I take from here is Ode to a Nightingale by Keats which I was obsessed with from the second I heard it in high school. I'm a weird high schooler. I heard like we, we learned Ode to a Nightingale by, by John Keats in my high school class. And for the whole rest of the day, I just went around like, oh my God, that Nightingale. And like, maybe I, maybe, uh, maybe I knew Keats in like a past life or something. <laughs> because It just like hit me so hard. Right. You know, um, so I'm thinking about that and I'm thinking about, uh, I was going through a really stressful, anxious time and thinking about the, the, the earth. And I kept waking up in the middle of the night and going to my children's um, beds to see if they were awake because they were quite young and I'm worried about them. Um, so that's what's happening too. Remix with a few lines from Keats. My throat is dry, a drowsy numbness pains. My sense is though obscured by smoke. I drive on roads, dividing patchwork farmland, fences, wide-eyed llamas, perpetual surprise. After a dream, I sip water in the dark. I don't want to sleep. My husband breathing deeply, my children twisting in their beds, smoke rising from the fields, end of harvest raising. I lift the rock, Find a family of wood lice curled away from me, sleeping or pretending to sleep, hemlock lacing the road's shoulders, my two dry eyes. The tender babies are paler than their parents, little ghosts rolled in on themselves. My children are sleeping. When I lift the blanket, when after a dream I smoke in the dark, no bird singing, nothing to ode, the sharp scent of pine, wet soil, beast musk, rain. The dull opiate of things, what will outlive us. I turn on the screen, a panel of men in a void screaming. Cornflowers curling into rust. I breathe in smoke, fists curled shut. The green of marijuana fields, the pungent scent of bodies curled in sleep as if sleep were a cure. One minute path, past, and leavy words. Hear that crackling? Pine cones dropping like heavy flames. Glaciers splitting, howling ghosts. What earth will be left for my children cry out in their sleep? Dark room filling with the smoke I exhale. Hills roiling, the screaming stays while the screen goes dark. I can't see it disappearing to thy high requiem. My throat is dry. Do I wake or sleep? I don't want to wake. I, oh, please come in, take a seat. You're more than welcome. Thank you for coming. Um, I, have tried to write many villanelles and have mostly not succeeded, but I got one so right here. <laughs> I got it. I got it. I finally got it. So um, this is a, if you don't know villanelle, it's, it's a, it's a tricky form. Um, it's a, it was originally a French form. It has um, tercets all the way through and then a quatrain at the end. But the thing that's tricky about it is there are two lines that are repeated over and over throughout the poem. And the reason why that's tricky is because you want, you want the meaning of those lines to sort of accumulate um, into a larger meaning as it goes instead of feeling just repetitive, right? So hopefully it, it sort of accumulates a kind of, in this case, obsession with the past. And this is called, this is called invoice for R. We were too young to imagine regret believing our lives a series of scenes written by us with no ending, no debt to repay for the way we lived, the sweat never cooling, the sky a constant between. We were too young to believe in regret, though we lived in the dust-worn sublets of a city that coughed and staggered unclean toward the train. 
oblivious to how the debt of time can annul a dream. While the violet winter light touched the tangled sheen we made together, too pale and lean to regret the silence we idealize, the faint alphabet of our breathing, unable to replace, it seems, the words we didn't say or write. There's a debt in the light that surrounds your silhouette, an unfolding of what I could not have foreseen. Why didn't I stay? I was young. I didn't know regret grew with time, with memory, that indelible debt. And I'm going to end with the last poem in the book. Um, and this is a little bit of a tricky one. Um, so I have some, I have a kind of intense history with depression. And I definitely um, needed a lot of help when I was younger to sort of climb my way out of it. And um, over the years, I, I have lost a, a a couple of friends to suicide. And um, the thing that, that drew me out of a really terrible depression when I was um, in my mid twenties was I was reading for my MFA exams because they took exams here. And I was reading uh, Whitman and um, I, I started reading the poem uh, for you. And Whitman has this way of sort of like reaching out to the reader constantly, like he's constantly talking at you, like he's reaching it's like, hi, I'm here. Like he's almost holding your hand. And it starts, I think, whoever you are, I fear you're walking the walks of dreams. And it goes on and and, and says at some point, um, you know, I, 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 he says, I love you at some point in, in the middle of the poem. And he says, um, no one has done justice by you. You have not done justice by yourself. Um, and it was one of those things, like I'm sitting in the library and I'm reading this poem, like for the first time as an MFA, MFA student. And I just started crying. I'm like sitting in the library crying. And I was like, yeah, I need to do, I need to do better by myself. Like I need to figure this out, um, which of course sort of helped me find therapy and, and various other things. And so when I, when I, you know, learned about my, my friends, you know, there, I think anybody who has somebody they love who, um, they've lost that way, um, want to think of what they could have said um, in order to speak with them <laughs> to make it so that it wouldn't have happened. And so this poem is sort of to my younger self because I understand that state of mind um, and sort of to the friends that I lost. And I'm you know, in no way saying this is the, the poem that would have done it or turned it around, but um, I wanted to speak to someone else in that moment the way I felt women spoke to me. Call. It lies dormant in you, some kind of happiness. Even through the morning rain, the mundane turn out of the drive, onto the road toward work, the keening daffodils rising green and gold from the mud. Even when the sidewalk's gray leads into your chest, a solid, immovable light is waiting. All those years I believed joy impossible. All those years I swerved down dim lit highways, the blur of headlights swirling around me or wandered weeping to the edge of a precipice or walked into a body of water, daring myself to breathe in. I'm speaking plainly now because I don't want to invite confusion or to remain alone in this bright field. Step away from the edge and turn toward me. I see you. I know that ache in your chest means that you want to live. That was amazing. Um, thank you, Danielle, for your reading. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, Matt.
um, for your readings as well. Um, thank you to all of you for joining us tonight. Um, Lindsay's book is sold out, um, but it'll be available for order downstairs. <laughs> um, but it'll be available for order downstairs. Um, and just as a reminder, um, we'd love to have you join for refreshments downstairs as well as book signings. Yeah. Okay. Good night. Thank you.